Hi, my name is Lauren Epstein, and you're listening to another episode of You're Hired. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is candidate experience. Basically, what that means is, what's it like to apply to some place <laughs> for, I guess I've been working 36 years, and I've applied to a lot of places. And like you, I've had some really negative experiences, but no one seemed to care about it. In the beginning of my career, you would write a resume and put it in an envelope, which is a, an envelope is a, a, a rectangular piece of paper that's hollow, and uh, you put something called a stamp on it and an address, which is uh, the location of where you're at, not the GPS location, but the actual physical address. And then your physical address, and you drop it into this thing called a post box, which then someone called a mailman or mail person would, would take and then magically get it across to wherever it had to go. And then you'd get these rejection letters. And I remember in college, we'd have walls of these, uh, I think called them dink letters, rejection letters. Uh, it's, you know, all the places that you get rejected from. Never a reason why. And who knows how we got jobs. But things have changed. The workforce has changed. What we call people are now called candidates, but we're trying to call them people again. As you know, you know, I've been involved in talent acquisition for my career, that what we're trying to do as a, an industry is make it a better experience for you when you apply so that we have a better chance of getting you and keeping you and growing as a company because most companies now need people. So I have some really amazing guests today, amazing, seriously awesome guests who have experience in candidate experience. They're talent acquisition professionals, kind of on, on two ends of the, the table here. With me, I've got Eileen Raymond, and she is the executive director for experienced hire recruiting at KPMG here in Virginia. And there she manages the recruiting efforts across several groups in North America. She has over 20 years of recruiting experience in the professional services industry. And she's led talent acquisition at SRA International, which is a big government contracting company. Previously, she was the global leader for talent acquisition and management at KPMG Bearing Point. And she started in recruiting at Anderson Consulting. Right now, she resides with her family here in Bethesda, Maryland. And the reason she is on the program today is her success with the Candidate Experience Awards, which are known as the Candies. And we're going to talk about that. My other guest, who is also a really awesome lady, is Elaine Orler. And Elaine is the founder. And by the way, Elaine, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm just so excited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, Elaine is the founder and CEO of Talent Function, which is now a global organization. It's been around for five or six years. And they facilitate the Candidate Experience Awards. And we're going to talk about what those awards are for. She has been designing and implementing global HR solutions as a practitioner as a consultant for more than 20 years. So I guess it's now six years. In 2011, she founded the Talent Board, a nonprofit organization focused on illuminating and promoting the quality candidate experience. The organization, its research, and its awards program have changed the conversation about how you, those of you who are listening, all three of you, are treated when you apply for a job. Welcome to the show, Elaine. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So first, were, were my introductions appropriate? Did I miss anything? I okay. think they're spot on, yeah. Yeah, and I would say for my part, just know that I have two worlds, Talent Function, which is the consulting firm helping organizations to actually get the equation right, and Talent Board, which is the one we're really talking about and the nonprofit for the candies. And as confusing as it will be talking to an Eileen and an Elaine, yes, I am Talent Function and Talent Board because I like to keep it confusing. For the folks who are listening, Elaine is the person who founded the organization that creates these awards. And these awards are given out to organizations who perform really well, making it so that you, as a person applying for a job, have a great experience, a better experience. And so we're going to talk about that. But before we kind of get into the solution, let's talk a little bit about the problem, because collectively we've been doing this for a while. So, so what's, the, what's been the problem, 
Eileen, you can start us off. Well, I think for us, it's been an evolution, obviously, starting recruiting over 20 years ago. In the past, it was don't call us, we'll call you. Resume was set in after an ad went into the Washington Post or a local newspaper. You'd get thousands of response, and then you will go through the resumes, read through them. Technology has, has changed things. Um, there's an expectation from the candidates that are sending information in that they want to hear back from you. And for so long, we really did still keep that attitude is we'll call you don't call us and in fact we don't want you to you know interface with us when we're not ready to um and it's so because we're so busy exactly we're so special yes we're so special and um we we do have hiring needs but we want to manage it on our our side and times have changed and there's an expectation from the recruits that when they submit a application they want to hear back from us they want immediate response and you're seeing that in so many different places in the marketplace um, not just in in professional services or in in recruiting um, you go out to a restaurant immediately after you finish you and you have your experience at a restaurant you go and you go to Yelp and you rate that restaurant it's really coming to that point with regards to from a recruiting perspective as well yeah so in a lot of the problems that you're talking about is that up until recently, you know, I don't know what recently is, but that a person would apply to a job posted in a newspaper or even on the internet, and it would take weeks or months, and they may or may not hear anything back, and then they would apply to another place and then apply to another place and another place. And it's interesting because even though it was kind of working, it wasn't particularly efficient, and nobody really liked it. What do you see or have seen as the problem uh, Elaine, with the way things have been working uh, up until the last so many years? Yeah. So having been in this industry now for 20 years, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have and what has and hasn't been working is we automated the manual process. You did such a great job of describing the paper process of folding and submitting your resume and then expecting to get a, a folded letter back that said some kind of, you know, already written script that said, this is how, you know, thanks for calling us, but you know, we'll contact you if we're if you're qualified, and that's where we are today in the systems and the way the systems have been designed. But we're seeing, though, is the reality as an industry and also as candidates become much smarter about the fact that they really own the control and the power in in their next career path. How they're taking that one step farther to say, I need feedback and I expect uh, respect. And that's one of the things, if I, if nothing else, from the awards process from day one was the opportunity to truly respect people as people, as other individuals, and making sure that communication is aligned with that. And I think our economy has shifted dramatically. You know, we've, had a, we've done a few shows. In fact, we did a, a show with Bill Drayton from Ashoka um, earlier where we're talking about how the rate of change in business is increasing and the way our systems in business our configuring is radically altered. When a company gets a project or has something going on, they need those people right away. And so our need for really talented folks has gone up dramatically. And if we don't get the person when we need it, they're not going to be available later. So businesses, business owners, CEOs want to hire the best quality people as quickly as possible for as little as possible. And that is now possible because of a lot of the technology, a lot of the advance, uh, advancements in dealing with candidates, uh, applicant tracking systems and other software, and also things like Monster and LinkedIn, which wasn't available to us before. I'd imagine 30 or 40 years ago, if a company needed to hire a lot of people, it was a lot more labor intensive. And so what, do you, what else do you see are some of the changes that are happening in business that are forcing the, the need for us to improve this process at all? Well, I, for KPMG, there's definitely a requirement around hiring people for the immediate need. We don't hire to necessarily a plan. We hire to the work that we win. We don't have people sitting on the bench. There's also rate constraints. Um, there are challenges with visa uh, sponsorship now in the marketplace. So if there's many, many challenges that the business is now contending with. Obviously, going to market, there's so many different competitors out there. 
We need to make sure that when we are bringing somebody in who's a qualified candidate for opportunities, that we close that person. We we have the premier white glove process in place. And I know historically in the past, you know, we weren't really doing such a great job. And going through the assessment and the candy awards and applying for the candy awards through the talent board really gave us some great insight into things that we were doing very well, but then also gave us some insight into the things that we weren't doing very well. And, you know, what did we have to do to, to adjust that and make sure that we really made improvements so people would be really, you know, excited to join our, our firm? Yeah, and I want to definitely talk about the Candy Awards. Like, uh, we, we've got some time, so I want to get to that because it's really kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And I know folks who are listening, they're like, what are the Candy Awards and how do I get one? If you listen, you'll know exactly what it is. So stay tuned. The, the business needs you talked about are completely different. Your business is now hiring as directly to their needs as possible. And I guess in the past, they might hire and might have more people than they needed. Now, KPMG is a consulting company, but this was probably true for a lot of companies where, hey, we just need someone and it wasn't as precise a match between revenue and expense, mm-hmm. right? Elaine, what are you seeing with that? Yeah, a lot more organizations have become, it is about the right fit and the right position today the open call box of if you're a good person, we'll find a spot for you, kind of ebbs and flows based on the type of talent an organization needs. I do think that um, today we're also starting to see truly the differentiation between, you know, talent is, to me, all people are talented in some way, shape, or form, but how that talent is applied to the position and the work that needs to be completed within that organization is being adjusted. So in some roles, um, there is a scarcity of the people that can truly do the fine-tuning work that's needed. In other roles, there's an, there's an abundance. So how do, you, how do you decipher between an abundance of available people to fill a position versus the scarcity of if I don't get this one, we run the risk of not having anybody, and that could jeopardize business. And um, how we... deliver our recruitment processes, how organizations think through these things um, are becoming really critical in order to compete. Um, I think the only competitive differentiation a business has is the talent that they're able to retain and acquire. Right. I think that's that's well said. We're talking about hard-to-find talent, which are probably for very high-level jobs, technical jobs or jobs that require very specialized skills and experiences. So this is a small segment of all jobs. And it's fair to say that because those jobs command a higher salary, companies are willing to spend the money to give, like you said, white glove treatment. But I think also we're seeing some of this technology move down into jobs where there's an abundance of people. Are you seeing that, uh, Elaine? I am. And I think um, in, in some cases, I see some more innovative technology when there's an abundance or a larger a larger population that could complete the job. So what's an example of that? Um, some of the organizations that are moving into much more um, self-service or the tools where um, if you think about and I and with the candy data that we have and, and the research, I'm talking about those that are moving first first job, first career, up to two years experience, typically millennials, though one-third of that population that are looking for those hourly or craft worker jobs happen to be baby boomers. So in that transitional pace, the application process is different. You're assessing into a skill set. You're put into a queue. If you have the right skills and you're available the right shift, you're moving into the next steps. And so there's, there's a lot more workflow automation that is taking on these activities to move somebody into probably the job. So something um, like again, a, a retail right. place might have like a little kiosk where you apply. Um, yeah, I see kiosks going to the wayside and much more mobile apps. Mobile apps, so going yeah. to an iPad um, or something and applying on an you know, iPad. The, we're starting to see even the advertisements. You're standing in you're standing in the retail establishment, and based on what they know about you, they're popping up a, hey, did you know we happen to have shifts available at this time kind of messaging even within within the retail apps within the other programs, depending on how a person signed up to be notified, um, more real time as you're standing there, it's like, oh, there's an opportunity. <laughs> right. So, so you're seeing trying, the... Trying to create more of that awareness directly with their consumers and, um, again, their customers 
at the time in which they might be available. Yeah, and if I can jump in, I mean, we're on the op- opposite spectrum. We look for very highly specialized professionals, um, CPA certifications, taxation folks, data scientists, uh, folks with um, secret security clearance for cyber work. And even those folks still want an easy experience. They do not want to be put into a website where you have to look around. They want you know, two clicks. They want to be able to apply very quickly. And so we have to accommodate that. It's really critical to to our success that we have an easy process for for people to to opt into. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think it's fantastic. Easy easy is so important. And then the challenge is it can't be so easy that we don't get enough information to figure out whether we should proceed or not. (laughs) A phone number isn't enough sometimes, right? so how do how do we make the collection of the information necessary in order to do an assessment but still make it easy enough that somebody is not you know spending and we have the candidate you know half an hour is on average for candidates to to apply to a job that's that's still 30 minutes for every job they apply to that's a lot of redundant time that could be moved out of the process now it's interesting cuz i think people listening to the show the two or three of you that are out there right now listening should know that the reason that you're applying in the way that a lot of companies want you to is because they want that information so they can make a determination of whether or not you're an appropriate candidate. And I think some organizations use really complex and detailed processes as a way of weeding you out. What do you think about that? I'll say, you know, again, if you're dealing with a large volume of folks, the amount of questions or the need to fit um, more specifically through an automation process is going to be there. But I, um, I know that when it, when there are more strategic and direct aligned positions, you know, fo- following through with all that is giving the recruiter and the and the hiring team the information they need to make those decisions more quickly. It is a burden in some cases, but from the candy data, the one thing we know from the candidate responses is any employer that's willing to put um, on their apply process or within their intake process with the candidate the open-ended question that says, is there anything else that we haven't asked or that you've provided that you believe would would be of value for us to know related to your skills and this position? Something along those lines where it gives the candidate that opportunity, much like the cover letters we used to do, which have gone by the wayside, that ability to explain I'm in a transition or I've just gotten this degree and I want in this profession, those things are becoming more and more valuable and that's where I'm seeing some of the changes come with the time and attention spent. It doesn't matter if I spent as a candidate 30 to 45 minutes applying. If I felt that I was truly being asked and contributing information that was relevant to the job and relevant to me in my application process. So as, and we've all been recruiters. So when we've sat at desks and we get your resume either by email or by paper, you know, our task is to go through this. I remember going through literally 500 plus resumes, paper resumes that my my boss just left on my desk. And I got so good at reading resumes, I could just go through them like in a in less than a few seconds because there's no other way to get through them and and, and find, you know, you uh, Elaine and Eileen, both of you could look at a resume and I think in a less than a minute, right? You could figure it out I because took, we had to look at resumes. I, absolutely. I actually, the, one of the best classes I took in college was a speed reading class. Oh, and really? So I could whip through them even faster. I mean, it was very, very quickly. And so I think it is important, obviously, the structure of a resume yeah. and, and make it recruiter friendly, obviously, um, is, is so important. But yes. Completely. But even we can read between the lines. Mm-hmm. We can even see if you're good, even though if you didn't write a good resume, mm-hmm. because we've seen so many of those resumes and hired those people that we know kind of what to look for and what isn't going to be there that we know what to look for. Um, that's your probably your experience too, Elaine. Is that correct? Absolutely. And uh, it's, um, it's not recruiters have the ability to find and pull out the right information. And the resume structure is also changing, though, too, because I think, you know, what we originally had as resumes that we were going to talk about from the years past, I mean, we're moving into more of a social social credentialing so whether it's a LinkedIn profile or Facebook profile or, or another other tools that are being aggressively developed to maintain your work history format, that kind of content that you build it as you as you are going through your career progression is even more valuable to a recruiter because you're not having to sit down and remember what you did four years ago and try to describe it. 
this is kind of content that's been built with you as you've gone through your career. It's important to know if you're listening is that it's really critical that we know who you are and what you do to know whether or not you're a fit. Well, and it may be not for that immediate position, but it could be for another position that opens up. And something that we really focus on is that when we get an opening, the first thing we do, uh, the recruiters are expected to look at our database. We have invested millions of dollars in those candidates that are in our database we need to look there first. We actually monitor the activity, the number of searches that they do in the system on a monthly basis. So you can bank sure. it. If you apply to KPMG and you get that email saying, we'll keep your resume, Absolutely. in fact, they do <laughs> it at KPMG. It is not BS. No, it is not right? BS. And the recruiters are expected to be in the system. And um, Can I ask how many folks do you hire out of the system, percentage-wise, ballpark? Oh, my goodness. I Give the listeners a little hope. Uh, no, I couldn't say that because their source of hire would not be the resume uh, bank. It would be wherever they came in from. Okay, so right? we don't know. No. But, but some. But I do know that they're doing the searches okay. because I track that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, But it, it is definitely something where, um, you know, you really, it, it's not, you know, once and you're done. You are in, and, and any good recruiting organization will do that. They'll keep, you know, in touch with you. They'll want to asked you to, to join their talent communities to make sure that you are actually ah, we're going to talk about talent communities okay. so, right. so <laughs> no no we're going to let's talk about good, that good. so so um you you have I know you have you guys do a good job there Elaine tell us about talent communities cuz this is new this is a new thing for our listeners to kind of know about if they're applying for some place and how do they distinguish between a good employer and not well I, it's a great question and um it's interesting cuz I think the listeners and anybody that's in the job search or has been for the last year and a half may not even understand, and I wish we, we should do a definition of terms to job seekers on what recruiter speak is. Because when we say talent communities, we're talking about that ability to collect the information from somebody, you know, they give us an email address or the basic contact information. They're giving us permission to market back to them and have a relationship and start to, to drive something. Job seekers may not even know it as that. It's like here's a, you know, join our mail list and put in your email address. In essence, is a talent community. And so often we kind of we use so much of our our recruitment speak that we translate it to the to the general mindset of a of an end user. So, um, so the I'll tools give an example. that recruiters have today, though, are. I, to me, I'm excited about the tools that we have as recruiters. Yeah, yeah. Talk about that because there's some great examples. One of the things I did in building a, what I call a talent community is people who are in the same discipline in a like a, an email list. That it's not just about me talking to them, but them talking to each other. And when we go to a city for a conference, we invite them all out for a drink. And so they get to know each other. So it's kind of a value proposition for them. That's I, I mean, I think you're right. We do need to have te- definitions. I don't think people know what that means. But what are some of the cool things that you've seen in this concept of, of engaging with people who are interested in the company, but maybe that's not the right time or the right position? And you, you, you just gave a perfect example of that. I would love to see more and more of that. You know, it's that ability to not just take is my best description. The organizations that are leading, and I suspect Eileen has a lot more of this, and I applaud. I'm just so excited about what KPMG is doing. Um, the organizations that are leading in this are not just taking the candidate information so that they can, in essence, spam them with irrelevant content. They're now taking the candidate information and aligning them in, in like you said, networks or communities or the right distribution of information joining um, even co- connection efforts within the organization. Where, where is that department division or topic being mastered? And how do we get these candidates to stay engaged? Joining seminars, um, joining webinars, attending on-site, you know, invitation-only open houses, where, again, it's not just necessarily it's a job today. This is about recruiting today and tomorrow and being ready for whatever the business needs when that candidate is also ready. Right time, right fit, right person, right um, right everything. So, but these are opportunities for them to also network. And then some of the better organizations I've seen as well and the ones that are really leading, if it's not the right candidate for them at the moment, it's how do they help them get socially connected so they do get the next career progression or that next opportunity somewhere else because that goes a long way in good intentions when the job does become available down the road. Potentially, you know, that candidate is going to be can stay open to the potential of even joining the organization in the future. 
So it's, again, I think our biggest uh, opportunity with these types of tools and connections and networking is that if it's not the right one right this minute, um, we have the opportunity to come back around later. And the candidates' appreciation for that, I mean, the employer's appreciation for candidates just even staying in the network is huge today. Elaine's a better person than I am because I wouldn't be giving my recruits to my competitors. <laughs> Wait, hold for a second. Okay, did well. you want? Have, hold on a second. Uh, did you want Colette to come in? No, no, no. It's fine. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Thank All right. You. Yeah. So, I mean, I love the idea of of what you said about it's it's now time to give to the candidates to create value. I had a candidate once. He was a, a UX guy. Amazing. This was in 2007. I talked to him for almost a year, like every few months, until finally he joined. And that's something that I, and I think recruiters now, they're like they're younger, so they're all digitized. They're not, they're not into phone calls, but that's what we're talking about, right? We were at the candidate award workshop last week or two weeks ago, and we were talking about, we want to have relationships with people because we know that's really the most valuable thing. And we have this incredible technology and these tools to build relationships with people. And that's, I think, like you said, I think fundamentally that's what we're looking to do, build better relationships. Absolutely. Yes. And, and then through those relationships, we have these long-term wins, right? Because then a year, two, three, four, five years down the road, the person that you talk to is like, oh, hey, I'd, I'd love to come work for KPMG, or I'd like to... Or they send referrals. Or they send referrals. Yep. We get a lot of referrals from people who just have been through our process and say, you know, I, not the job for me, or hey, not interested now, but let me put you in touch with so-and-so. And it, it is enormous. It, it, it's absolutely fantastic. So what are some of the things that KPMG is doing to this like next iteration of great experience for people who are looking to apply rather at, at KPMG? Well, it's basic fundamentals, quite frankly. It, it's really not rocket science. It's going back to how do you want to be treated when you're going through the process? What is going to be impactful? And so I think it starts with really the the first communication that you have with us, our, the application, the website. Um, speaking with a recruiter who, you know, we're training the recruiters to make sure they know about the positions and they can speak to the business, making sure that we're training the interviewers and making sure that they're on, that they are representing the, com- the company, um, they're doing a thorough assessment of the individual. These things don't cost money, it's just, it's just time, right? And then the other part is the communication piece. You know, don't just expect that you talk to you know, somebody once and then you just let them go into the black hole. That constant communication is so important. And even with technology, they still want to talk to somebody. You still need to let them and keep them apprised of what's happening through the process. If they're not a fit, having that difficult conversation saying, I'm sorry, you're not a fit. It's sort of like breaking up with somebody, but you, know, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta have that conversation. And so we spent time with the recruiters on that. Um, but really, I, I think for, for us, it's been in getting the feedback from our surveys was that where we really needed to improve was on that communication piece. Are there any specific things other than the basics of being the good company? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, I think that it's going to be giving more insight into the process to our recruits. So on our website, actually posting what the interview process is going to be. Uh, we are looking at doing more um, open um, like open house chats um, using a platform called Brazen. Um, it's been very successful for us. Which is also located here in Arlington. Yes, they are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great company. Um, yeah, Ed Barrientos is uh, leading that company. He's a great guy. Yeah, and Ryan Healy. Yes, they're, they're great. So we've had great success with those um, those programs. I'm name dropping. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's what we do on this radio show. It's like the one guy I know. They're, well, he's, they're great. Um, but uh, making sure that um, our systems are, I think, user-friendly, continuing always making enhancements, um, and then looking at video interviews, not the job postings. You know, ugh, you got to do them for, for compliance purposes, but, you know, they're really not as, as snazzy as we'd like them to be, and obviously it, it, keeping people engaged. So, Elaine, what are some of the things that you've seen in the field of what's kind of cool and neat that are our folks should look for as a distinction between the the good companies and the other company. First things I would tell candidates today is that we definitely know the organizations that care are going to be more upfront on the communications. So candidates should easily be looking for is there a candidate bill of rights? Is there some summary somewhere on the web page that says this is what you can expect? Um, is there any kind of contact information? And I'm not saying just can I email the recruiter or call, you know call crazy recruiters all the time, but it, 
is there some format or some some way in which the organization is saying, look, you know, we we care that you've spent the time and attention to to apply or give us information. Here's what you can expect in return. And I think those things are are the ones that are starting to really push higher value. I don't think there is a greater compliment to a recruiter than a recruiter telling a candidate, thanks so much for being through this process, but we're not going to proceed with you. But, you know, we're at this moment, this is not the right job, but maybe future. And that candidate be so grateful for the experience and how it went that they do refer somebody that gets hired. And I think that kind of relationship where the candidate is not feeling like they went into a black hole is ultimately the whole reason why we created the Candy Awards in the first place and why organizations like KPMG are are pushing to change the mindset that companies don't care about the people that apply because it's exactly the opposite. It's just the difference between dealing in volume and or expectations. Um, no company will survive without the right talent. So just, again, seeing the organization starting to recognize and put those commitments up front in expectations, in better communication, or even just in availability. Um, the tools that are coming in the next year that I think more organizations will start to use are things like the chatbots, which will just allow for a little bit better interaction. Or we're going we're to talk about point. the chatbots in a second. We're going to take a yeah. quick break. Sure. You're listening to You're Hired on 96.7 FM. We'll be back in just a minute. You're listening to You're Hired on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. Thanks for listening to our show. If you're interested in getting on the show, you can give me a call at 240-876-0276 or follow us on Facebook at You're Hired. And you can join my meetup where we teach interview skills at interview skills to get the job at meetup.com. Again, I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. You're listening to You're Hired on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. Welcome back. I am here with Elaine Orler and Eileen Raymond. We're talking about the candidate experience. Elaine, you were talking about chatbots, but before you do, I wanted to just kind of comment on something. 20 years ago when I got into recruiting, I was working at an agency, and we would all get together all of the recruiters and share candidates. That was like a big deal. And we would do it every single week. And the idea was, how can we help these people find jobs? And we would talk to people at seven o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, on the weekends. The first person I placed, I picked him up from his house in my car and I drove him to his interview at Toys R Us in New Jersey. And he got hired, he was an Oracle DBA. I picked him up in my car. I, I, I can't believe I did that. It's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I never did it again. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing that we did because, you know, it mattered, right? And and we had this high incentive because we were obviously getting paid a fee. But we're kind of doing, we in, in corporations now are doing some of these things that agency folks have been doing for a while. So tell us about chatbots. Chatbots is a technology piece. Of, we're just, we've moved so much, um, even just, outside of recruiting, but with technology and, you know, we can go into artificial intelligence and all these other things that are really coming into mainstream life. Um, most everybody's on Twitter now. We were, you know, seven years, eight years ago, you said Twitter to half the, half the population and they looked at you funny. So as we look at what's coming next, you know, this automation when you call for your flight status, automation for these other things why we don't have it when it comes to my job search? How come there is no 1-800 number I can call and give my name and it looks up my reference number and says, oh, well, we've been trying to reach you. You know, we want to schedule an interview. Could, you know, tell us what times you're available. The, that kind of component. So for me, chatbots are similar. It's the, I'm on the website. I'm a little confused. What can I expect next? These are the tools that are going to help me navigate. Um, and not just those, but tools that are um, more efficient at helping me navigate the company's job descriptions with my capabilities. So um, we see some of these in, in realistic job previews that are published now, some gamification that is actually coming into, you know, are you qualified to do this job? Take so our, What have know, we seen like, in gamification? That's interesting. Um, different, um, a lot more, again, at the entry level. So there, and some of these I've seen a gamification component to, you know, being a, a front clerk. So do you, do you have what it takes to handle a customer's crazy order? And it, it takes you through kind of a, a, 
um, stimulation based process, but you're you're acting in in re in reaction to the experience, but at the same time, it's an, it's basically an elevated assessment. Do you have the skills to remain calm in a tough situation? Do you have the skills to um, communicate when somebody else is being irate? And it's looking for those behavioral pieces. But it, it's in a gaming-based model where um, you're basically, walk, I won't quite go to virtual reality yet because I haven't, I've seen a couple companies playing with VRs, but not quite yet. But um, that concept where you're actually getting to act a little bit into the role to even see if you like it. And the opportunity for candidates to opt out now, that's not a job I want to do. That's not something I want to do. And then they opt out versus the employer having to send the thanks but no thanks message because this is the real job. It's not anything else than what we're looking at here. So tools like that are really changing the way in which people decide which which job they need, which job they want to go for, and again, this is I'm going to go back to because we've talked about the difference between the kind of the highly skilled and the and the the specific unique roles that we're trying to fill that we can't find them. But this is more in the I'm either starting, I'm launching in my career, or I'm interested in a second job, or I've retired from my career, but now I just want to do some other hobbyist based work. And, I, and so, how do they? How do you make a distinction between what those roles would be? So a lot more tools, a lot more opportunity, and take it back to the chatbot. That communication that's that feels more personal may not ha- doesn't have to be a person, but it's more relevant to what I'm trying to accomplish at the moment versus needing to go look up an FAQ. Right. So I mean, what we're talking about is some of the really creative ways that companies are trying to attract and hire you, regardless of what job you're applying for, whether it's a uh, a first job out of college or uh, an hourly job or as KPMG, a very sophisticated consulting position. Uh, One of the things I did a a few years ago, I had to hire a team of recruiters in India. So for about a month, I video interviewed over 100 people. And then I went to India and I brought my finalists, my 13 or 14 finalists, to one city for one full day. And I had them actually do recruiting. So first I paired them up and they introduced each other themselves and they talked and they didn't know why but then I had everyone stand up and talk about the person they just met with and then I had them write job descriptions and then I had them go into a room with some other recruiters and get on the phone and get on the computer and start recruiting people and I think you're going to see more of these things where where you know as like Elaine's talking about virtual reality where instead of talking to you about the job we're going to have you do the job so we know whether or not one you want to do it with us and how well you can actually do it. And it was amazing because me and the other vice presidents really saw very quickly how, how the wheat and the chafe just separated. It didn't take long. It was probably within the first 20 or 30 minutes, and nothing changed. After that, we kind of like we saw roughly where things were. But uh, it's, it's fascinating that we're seeing all this really cool technology to make it easier for companies to hire, but also make the experience more pleasurable and and find the right people because sometimes we miss the right people and we know we miss the right people. We know, yeah, you were the right person, but we just didn't get it right, right? Because we've, we've had to hire people and then fire them right, right away. Mm-hmm. That happens. So let's talk about the Candy Awards. I, I'm really excited about this. This is something that uh, Elaine started about six years ago now. Yeah, we're in our we're in our seventh year this year for the awards. It's amazing. Seventh year, and and just so you know, one of the reasons that we're all here is that a couple of weeks ago, uh, Elaine had a workshop for talent acquisition professionals who are interested in getting involved in the candidate awards here in D.C. And uh, it was at Key PMG, and Eileen Raymond hosted. And one of the reasons she hosted, besides being probably really super excited about him is that you are a winner. Yes, that is correct. Right. So you, two for those years you, running. Two years <laughs> running. They have won the Candidate Experience Awards. Very exciting for KPMG. Now, we're going to get into it, but you guys got a trophy, right? Yes, we did. Where is your trophy? Uh, with uh, Lisa Ralston, our marketing person. Right. Yeah. So uh, what I've heard is that when companies win the award, the CEO or some leader like grabs that trophy and puts it into their trophy case. Yes, is that, is that right, Elaine? Yes, and I get more and more requests for, can we please have a second copy and anything because it's never coming out of the executive's display case and we really would like to hone it in talent acquisition. So it's a, it's, it's, it's humbling to us and exciting that there is that much recognition today internally and, and becoming more and more externally, but these companies that are 
priding themselves on the fact that they're treating people well, and that's what we wanted. I, I couldn't have asked for anything better than that alone in, when we launched this whole program. And so companies are looking for all these ways to be competitive, and this is the new way. Five or six years running, this is the new way to kind of get that advantage in the marketplace, which is getting more competitive. So, Lane, tell us how the awards work, basically. Sure. Um, well, we, uh, when I can tell you, when we launched the program, we the intention was is that we, uh, the, the, the few of us that were on the board at the time, our initial goal was we wanted organizations to have something to reach for in creating a positive candidate experience. And much like most candidates are probably listening to this and and probably still feel a little bit of this today, um, that black hole effect, the no communication, the I spent 30 minutes on doing your application, you can't even give me 10 seconds of your time to tell me if I'm in in the process or not, that frustration and anxiety that was going on, um, we felt that there was a different way instead of just raising, you know, yelling at companies for doing it bad, we decided that there's always an award process that we really should, if we focus on those that are doing it right, if those that are really striving to make a difference and be better at what they're doing, they should be elevated and candidates should know who they are because they can expect a better um, experience with those organizations. And in essence, by more organizations competing, the bar gets higher on what that level of attention needs to be. So similar to other awards where, um, it is a um, audience-based or a what is that, a voting by candidate vote. Our awards program is completely dependent on the candidate's responses to their experience with that employer. So there is no secret judging. There is no um, pay-to-play, which happens a lot globally in other award programs. This is the true People's Choice Award for job seekers. And this last year, um, our global response was a little over 228,000 candidate surveys around the globe. And through those surveys and the rankings that candidates gave their experience with those employers through an exhaustive number of questions and their overall experience based on what stage they went through, those scores aggregate out which companies are the winners. And it's a completely a blind analysis process for us. We don't know who they are. We just see the scores. We draw the line on, you know, in North America because of the number of participants being in in the hundreds now at about 50. And then we reveal who they are, and then we celebrate them. So the intention being is that now we have the statistical um, information, and the employers each have their statistical responses. They know the candidate's overall sentiment. They know um, where, where in their process from attraction, interview, um, application, interview, offer, et cetera, what is and isn't working. So they have more information to go and make it even better for the next year, thus raising the bar each year on the competition. (laughs) And you know if the company is involved with the Candidate Experience Awards because they bake in a little bit of software so that after the, just after or through the process, you get this questionnaire and it's like a 68 questions? (laughs) Depending on how far you went in the process. So we... Um, I would say that when we in, when we launched the program, none of us were scientific data scientists that knew every formula to surveys. Because right now, and the, the way we're over surveyed, I think in the market on a lot of things. But give us a, a five star rating just to give us a thumbs up or thumbs down isn't enough information on the job deeper experience. That's great if I you know was on Amazon and I bought a product and I liked it, and those are great. But if I'm a job seeker, I've got multiple touch points and different things I might want to say about that experience because it's much more personal. Right. So, when, so Elaine, one, one quick question. So when 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 does someone know that they're that they're getting surveyed? Is it after the first time they send the resume, or where in the process do you then reach out to them and give them the questions? It's a great question. And in fact, um, as as the talent board and the entity that runs the awards, we don't actually send out the surveys. So each employer that makes a decision that they want to survey their candidates actually send out those surveys, and we encourage them to send out surveys to you know all candidates that they've received in whatever time frame, six months, last nine months, regardless of whether they've been hired or not, regardless of whether they've applied, if they're in the community. We've had several organizations that have wanted to be so transparent to their candidates, they put their survey links on their Facebook page, on their LinkedIn page, they publish it out on Twitter, telling anybody that's ever been a candidate to respond. 
Um, so, but in the normal they, process, if if what when does it when does it usually occur? Do they just email it out like right after they're done with the interview in their disposition? Yeah, the awards program runs annually, so we we have the candidate survey collection process open for about five months. So it's open now for any employer that's in the process. So the candidates might be receiving an email. They could, and again, each employer has a variety of different ways they can do it. Some of them send emails at the point of apply. Some of them are sending out the notifications as soon as they're scheduled for an interview, or if if they even if they receive them, they determine they weren't qualified. And they're sending them a thank you note. The the survey link is in that message as well. And it's like um, sixty some odd questions, right? Mm-hmm. And Sorry. Elaine, when do you when do you, I mean? Excuse me. You're right. It was complicated. I can't get your names right. Eileen, when is it that you guys send? When does KPMG send out there? Oh, I wish I knew that exact answer. I don't, but I do know um, this past year we had over sixty five hundred respondents. Sixty five hundred respondents, yeah. and and the first year I know it was like eleven thousand, and now it's over two hundred and twenty thousand. So we're learning a lot. I mean, worldwide yes. for the awards, we're learning so much now about what candidates are wanting, and these awards results are published for free, right? Yeah, we um the we um, because of. The talent board itself as an entity is a, is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we designed the program that way intentionally because we want this to be an organic and a movement from the talent acquisition folks that really care, like KPMG who's winning, um, to really contribute back to the to those candidates that we're we're desperately trying to hire and those candidates that are desperately looking for jobs. So by being a nonprofit, we're completely funded by sponsorships and underwriters and research firms, which then allow us to continue to to deliver the program in such a way that there's no cost to a candidate to compete. Um, There's employers as a marginal cost just to get through the acquisition, to get through the application process. But then we have this research and data, which is now fully published and complimentary by us. So anything on the talentboard.org page. The fee is, is like a few hundred bucks uh, to, to do it now? Yeah, it's, I think somewhere around 250 depending on the region and how much you want to go globally. Not much. But not much. So if you're a business leader, if you own a business, you're in talent acquisition, you should get connected with the Kennedy Awards. And, and why? So what's the net result other than winning, right? What's happened to KPMG? What's the, the, the big story? It's been so impactful um, in a sense that we've really worked with our recruiters. We've worked with our um, folks that are interviewing. Um, We've seen a significant increase in our offer acceptance. Uh, We've seen a decline in our time to fill. Uh, We have seen an increase, a significant increase in employee referrals and referrals from candidates. Uh, And all that comes down to to cost, right? I mean, so you're seeing a reduction in cost. Um, Your uh, revenue, obviously, is impacted by time to fill. The number of days your job is left open and unbillable, you know, you're losing revenue. So it it has a profound impact. Um, But the other part that I think is sort of not measurable, but... Um, when you're working in a professional services or you know, recruiting isn't just a standalone unit. You work with so many other groups in the organization to interview. And so when we won the Candy Awards, it wasn't just the talent acquisition won the Candy Awards. KPMG, all of us, the interviewers, all of us won it together as a collective group through how we execute on interviewing and recruiting candidates. And um, it was really exciting for, and, and I think so many of the business leaders were excited to hear that, and they've shared some of that information with our clients because a lot of times clients are concerned about, well, if I hire you, you know, or, are you going to be staffed to support my job? And that's an issue. And when you have these types of awards, um, it certainly helps with that. So uh, along the dimensions that you measure your business, they've all gone the right way. Absolutely. That's awesome. And so... Um, Elaine, what are some of the other benefits, and maybe you can call out some, of these candidate awards? How much better has this process gotten, no, not just here, um, but across the world? I, I hear so many direct employer stories, and even with the research that we publish, we try to do as many case studies as we can. The two things I want to I want to pivot on on that, which makes sure that people understand in the awards, is um, we only celebrate the winners. Um, as, a, as an entity and everything else that we do, we will never publish a company that competed for the award that didn't win. And I think for employers, that's a safety net because a lot of organizations that approach saying, oh, it would be great if we could win the award, but our process isn't good enough. We would never win. 
this concept of you know they're they're in a need to make improvements but don't have the data or the research to do it we're that safety net because you can you can go through the benchmarking process you can survey your candidates if you don't win you're given a benchmark tool back with your data against the aggregate total data against the winner set so each employer can see my score was X the winner set score was Y the overall average score was Z and this is clearly an area we need to focus on to improve. And even the candidate sentiment and response, why? Why was this working or not? What was the issue? So that's all feedback to the employer to make those internal changes to compete again. But yeah, Elaine, if I can just jump in on, on that too. I think it's also a great um, measure for uh, making business cases if, you know, we, we talked about in the workshop a bit about the requisition distribution with recruiters owning so many openings. And if a recruiter has any more than, you know, 20 openings, they're not really going to be very effective. They're not going to be able to communicate and do that high level touch that they need to that the can- candidates are expecting. Um, so getting that feedback, if the feedback is p- the recruiters weren't being responsive, I never heard back, black hole, you could really make a business case for adding more resources to help your business and manage that process. So you can turn a bad into a good. Right. And so all this measuring around the awards allows us to manage, mm-hmm. which we know if you can measure it, you can manage it. Well, I want to say I want, I'm so grateful that you both came on the show today. This is just wonderful because for me, this is exactly what we need to get into the space and those of you who are listening need to connect with, well, one, you should apply to KPMG and look at all their jobs. And two, you should connect with the Candy Awards, the Candidate Experience Awards. And if you work at a company and you're not in talent acquisition, let them know. I mean, let your employer know that this is a great tool. It costs a couple hundred bucks and you get all this great data and you can improve your, and maybe you don't have all the resources to do crazy stuff, but there's always something you can change to make things just a little bit. A lot of the things that were said today were very small changes just in the way we do business. So Elaine, how can folks reach out to you if they want to? You can always find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, but uh, thecandies.org or thetalentboard.org our URLs or just put in Candidate Experience Awards and any search engine will, will pop up. Um, we have a lot of information, uh, uh, free information available for download from the research reports of the last couple of years, plus the process, some videos on, on what it takes to get through the process and things like that. But uh, um, we're always available to talk with anybody that needs assistance in making the decision to compete for the award. or um, And we're just now starting to, to dabble in more content for job seekers. So we're excited to be taking the information we're learning from this and turning it back around to help job seekers be more successful. So you'll start to see a lot more content on our webpage around tips and tricks for the job seeker experience going forward. That's wonderful. And Eileen, is, their organization is incredibly generous, so I'd, I recommend you reach out to them. And Eileen, how can folks reach out to you if they'd like to contact you or apply for a job? Uh, LinkedIn would be fantastic or to kpmdcareers.com. Okay. And on LinkedIn, you're E-I-L-E-E-N? Yes. Raymond. Correct. Awesome. I want to thank you both for joining us today on You're Hired. I'm Lauren Epstein, your host. We'll see you next week on another episode of You're Hired.